So here's our announcements. Don't forget that next Sunday, Christmas Eve, next Sunday, Christmas Eve, there is no evening service. So be Sunday school and uh, the morning church service. And in the morning church service, we have a nice sing time and a Christmas story. Then there's Wednesday night and then New Year's Eve is Sunday. There again, on New Year's Eve, there will be no evening service. Now, here's the big thing. When we have next Saturday, one week from yesterday, there will be a truck parked over here by the dumpster. And we've got about an hour and a half, two at the most, if four or five guys come. So I, I, I can't say, if you can come, come. No, I, I need you there. And then we'll be there again the following Saturday to get whatever else is left because we got a bunch of junk that's been sitting in the dumpster for a year or three. And the trash guys won't take it. But we have a truck. If we throw it in the truck, the truck will take it. But we've got to do the labor. So I'll do what my dad used to do. If you can be here this coming Saturday or the following Saturday or both, at nine o'clock in the morning and give me two hours raise your hand okay I, I I gotta have somebody here because if I'm by myself it's not hard thank you I have three or four that's good it's just if it's a 10-foot piece of lumber I, I need help getting it up on the truck you know that kind of a thing it's it's just kind of awkward it's not hard bring your gloves we'll get it thrown on the truck and then little john will take the truck after the new year comes around and he'll take it to the dump and we'll get rid of all that and get that all cleared out if in the meantime anytime during the week you're driving by and say oh stop and grab a piece of something and chunk it chunk it in if you know you're gonna if you have tuesday afternoon off give me a call i'll meet you up here and we can throw a couple of pieces in that's all we need you understand it's not a lot of work, it's just more than a one-person job at any given time. So if you have any time free, call me, I'll meet you here. We'll spend half an hour or 45 minutes and we'll throw some stuff in and we'll be done with it. And by the time New Year's gets here, it'll all be on the truck and little John can take the truck to the dump and it'll be cleaned out. All right, but we've got to get it done now or if I call the people to come and get it, it costs us like 500 bucks. And they'll, oh, they'll do the work for us, but I don't want to spend $500. Okay? So, yes, ma'am. Mary. Yes. Mary, we got word today, Mary did pass away. She passed away yesterday, Saturday. And at this particular uh, point in time, they're planning to have just a family-only uh, funeral service. If anything changes, they'll let me know. And as soon as they let me know, I'll let y'all know. But they're not planning to have uh, a funeral service per se, just family stuff. So if, uh, if that changes, I will get on the phone and call all of you, okay? But other than that, that's where that stands now, okay? And is there anything else that I've forgotten to mention? All right, then let's get to our message tonight. And uh, tonight, uh, we're going to get on part four. We talked about the historical background of Christmas. We talked about who the Magi were. This morning we talked about uh, why it was in Bethlehem, okay? We talked also last week about uh, when Jesus was born. And tonight we're going to talk about the legalities, all right? And you'll see there I've got about 20 slides. So it'll, it won't be all that long, but I've got to get through this. And there are lots of technicalities. And everything that I'm going to mention tonight as a technicality has another, if you wanted to, another hour or so of research you could do. I've boiled it down. But I, I suggest, I encourage, I implore you, do your own homework. Go through and you learn it. As I used to tell my students, you can listen to me lecture and you can take a couple of notes and you'll pass the quiz and probably pass the test, but you really won't know it. You'll just know the answers, but you won't understand the material. You can listen to me preach and you can take some notes and you can know the material kind of, but you really don't know it. Study it on your own. The Bible says you study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. You rightly divide the word of truth. So again, I encourage you, do your own personal Bible study. It makes all the difference in the world for you. All right, so let's talk about the legalities. The genealogies of Jesus Christ are talked about in John, Luke, and Matthew, but not in the book of Mark. Why? 
Well, in John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 14, it talks about Jesus as the Messiah. In Luke chapter 3, 23 through 38, it talks about Jesus being human and Jewish. Okay? Uh, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 16, it talks about Jesus being the rightful king. So it sets those all up. But in Mark, there's no genealogy given. And that's because in the book of Mark, it talks about Jesus being the servant. And in their culture, in their society at that time, ser nobody cared where a servant was from. So Mark doesn't give us that. But if you compare the genealogies, it, it is important because they are corresponding, but they're not the same. And there's a reason why they're not the same. It's not to confuse anybody, but it's giving specific, detailed information for a reason. Okay? We also find one of the legalities is a very, very strange blessing. We see in the book of Ruth, chapter 4, verse 12. And I'll read that to you here. And uh, Ruth's about to have a baby. And the, the people of, the, come up to her and say, oh, that's really great, you're having a baby. Let your house be like the house of Pharez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So they're saying to Boaz, hey, Boaz, this is great. Your wife's pregnant. I hope she's just like Tamar, or like Pharez was. Well, Pharez was born of Tamar. He was illegitimate. Why would you ever go up to somebody and say, man, I hope you have all the good stuff that an illegitimate child brings you? That was the, that, what, but they were being serious. This was a blessing. Why? Because God had said, it is through Pharez that the Messiah will come. So, Boaz, your wife is pregnant. That's great. Maybe she'll be the one that gives birth to the Messiah. But in order for the Messiah to come, you have to have at least 10 generations away from Pharez. According to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23. In order to inherit the estate, if you're illegitimate, it has to go 10 generations. So, could Ruth's son, first child, be, be that one? No. But her grandson could be. Okay? We find out that he is. Pharaoh was born illegitimate. We find that whole account in Genesis chapter 38. There are legal restrictions as to that and inheritance in Deuteronomy chapter 23. We just talked about that. And then we see how it fulfills in, in Ruth 4. So in Ruth 4, we find this. Now here are the generations of Pharaohs. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, it says the illegitimate child cannot inherit until 10 generations. All right. So there's Pharaoh. You see him there? He's the first guy. Then he had a son, Hezron, and then Ram, and Aminadab, and Nason, and Salmon. Bo Boaz. Boaz is number seven. Boaz has a child, Obed, number eight. Obed has a child, Jesse, number nine. Jesse has a child, David, number ten. Can David, not that he has to be, but can David then actually be eligible to be the king? Yes, so can his older seven brothers and all his male cousins. So who's going to be the king? God says, I will choose David. And you go back to the story, you remember when, when the prophet comes to Jesse's house and says, Oh, surely it's, a, it, it, it's this, this boy. No, it's not him. Well, it's this one. No, not him. God hasn't picked any of these. Don't you have any others? Well, our youngest son, David, he's still out with the sheep. We didn't figure you needed him. Somebody's got to watch the sheep. You boys go back out and take care of the sheep and send David in here. David walks in. David is about eight years old, give or take a day. And God says, that's him. Okay, so why is it David? God picked him. You go back to the book of Deuteronomy, and God tells Moses, when you get to the promised land, you will want a king. When you get to the promised land, you want a king, you can have a king. It's okay with me if you have a king. But the king must come from the tribe of Judah, from the line of Pharaohs, ten generations later, and I will pick him. David met all those criteria. All right? So remember, God promised to establish David's kingdom, his throne forever. We talked about that this morning. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Nathan, go tell David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. I was with thee everywhere you went. I have cut off your enemies, so you're okay. I made your name great, like unto the name of the great men of all the earth. 
I will appoint a place for my people Israel, go on down to verse 16, thy house, thy kingdom will be established before thee forever. So David's son, and again, remember, it, we, we understand this, but in the Jewish speech patterns, when I talk about your son, I talk about any male descendant. It could be your 15th great-grandson. Son just means blood relationship heir, okay? David, your son, your bloodline will always be on the throne. So when the Messiah finally gets here someday, who's he got to be a blood relative of? David. Ergo, he is an Israelite. Ergo, he is of the tribe of Judah. Ergo, he is from Pharaoh's. He's from Boaz. He's from David. We talked this morning. He's from David and Bathsheba, but not Solomon, but Nathan, their second son. Okay? So, let's take a look at how all this works. You see then, on the, uh, you should have this on your paper, your chart. There's Luke. He talks about the, that the Messiah came from God. He was created. Matthew, he comes through Abraham. He's promised. He comes through Matthew later. But he's through David. He's blessed. So you start with Adam. Get all the way down here to Terah. That is Abraham's dad. Then Abraham has a bunch of kids. And you get down here eventually to David. David is not Abraham's child, but he's his son, his blood descendant. David goes up to Solomon through Bathsheba. And they come all the way down here to Jeconiah. But Jeconiah does something bad, and God says, nobody from the family of Jeconiah can ever be king again. So Satan won, and God can't fulfill his promise, and the seed of David can't be the king anymore because Jeconiah got cut off. Ah, not so fast. Let's see what else happens here. David's line through Solomon was terminated. Jeremiah chapter 22. This man, Coniah, uh, he, he goes after idols and so forth. Thus saith the Lord, in verse 30 down here, write this man, Je Coniah, or Jeconiah, write this man childless, a man shall not prosper, no one from his line will ever be the king. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you get down here to Jeconiah, and you follow his line in the book of Matthew, you get to Joseph, the guy who married Mary. Can Joseph be the king? No, he's under the blood curse that God put on Jeconiah. And he married Mary. So can any of Mary and Joseph's boys ever be the king? No, they're under the blood curse God put on Jeconiah. However, Mary's firstborn son, Jesus, actually Joshua, Jehovah Ashia is his real name. He's not Joseph's son. Now, got all that? More is coming. <laughs> And point G enters in here the law of Zelophehad, and you have to know the details. Now, most of you have heard this before, but we have to understand it, so I'm going through it again, because repetition is the soul of learning. All right. The details of the law of Zelophehad. Let me just, I'll, I'll freelance this one at you. We talked this morning about how the land, the piece of property, always stayed in the family name. You could lease it out, but it would always come back at the, at the year of Jubilee so that your family always owned the land. And it was always passed from father to one of his descendants, one of his male descendants, one of his sons. Whether it was a son or a grandson or a great-grandson, it didn't matter, but one of his blood descendants. But there was this guy by the name of Zelophehad, and he only had girls. He didn't have any sons. So he came to Moses and said, I like the law and God is right and all that kind of stuff, but when I die, I have no son to give my land to. How's that going to work? Moses went to God and God, he said, what do I do? And God said, ah, the guy who is asking you this, his name is Zelophehad. So we'll call this the law of Zelophehad. If a fellow only has daughters, then his daughter, his eldest daughter, most likely, doesn't have to be his eldest daughter, but his daughter, one of them, We'll find a young man that wants to marry her. Okay? And so here's Fred. And Fred wants to marry Susie because Susie's dad has no sons. But Fred is the son of George. Fred has to, in American present-day terminology, bear with me, he has to divorce his father. 
cut off all legal ties to his father. He's then adopted by Susie's dad as Susie's dad's adoptive son, legal heir. Follow me here? That was the law of Zelophehad. Then when Fred and Susie have a child, their firstborn male child will be called whatever her dad was, Peter Jr. And he carries on Zelophehad Jr. He's, he's, he's the new Zelophehad. You follow that, how that works? Yes, sir? In that scenario, then, Fred would never take anything from George's estate. Fred's dad, he, he's, he is out of that inheritance. Okay? Now, the, the difficulty here, the, no, it's not difficulty, the thing to understand is, even though Joseph was under the blood curse, and had it not been the, for the blood curse, Joseph would have been king. He was the rightful king as far as the bloodline goes. But he's under the curse. And he, nor any of his sons, can ever be the, be the uh, king. But when he is adopted by Heli, he gets, we're going to get there in a second, but when Jeconiah is cursed so none of his descendants can be the king, you go back to David and Bathsheba, their son Solomon, go to his brother Nathan, and you come down and Heli is the guy who would be king. So Heli, he's not king because the Romans are in charge. We'll get to that in just a second. But Heli would have been king, and his son would be the king after him. He's not because of the Romans, but he's the rightful heir to it. He adopts Joseph. And Joseph and Mary's firstborn male child would be then the guy who carries on the blood lineage descendancy rightful heirship to the throne because he's now been the Joseph has become the adopted son of Heli. But Joseph's son, even though Joseph has divorced his father's estate, he's still under the bloodline curse. So when Joseph and Mary marry under the law of they get married under the law of Zelophehad, the royal line is terminated. It's gone. Nobody born after that can ever be the king. Except that Mary's firstborn son is not Joseph's son. He's not under the blood curse. He's the child of God, born of the Virgin Mary. So he has all of the rights of lineage, and I, I won't get into a lot tonight, but it's worth it's worth. It's, this is not real deep and heavy, but you can find out. He's, Jesus is of the house and of the lineage. He's the right bloodline, and he's still the right house. Okay? So he can now be king. He meets both legal standards. And those are, we see in the Bible, he's of the house and lineage of, house and lineage of David. But they have specific legal referencing in Jewish law. It's not just, oh, he's, he's David's descendant, he should be king. There's more to it than that. It's deeper than that. He's of the house and the lineage. They're legal terms. Ergo, it's, I was talking to a lady, our waitress, at dinner today. It is incumbent upon us, if we really want to understand the scriptures, to understand the culture and the legalities and all that kind of stuff that went on during Bible days. So we can have, bear with me here, because there's nothing wrong with what I'm what, what I'm comparing with, comparing with. We can have all of the final graphs Sunday school lessons we want, and they're good. Because you got to start somewhere. But if all the education you ever got was first grade, how much would you know? Look, Jane, see, spot, run. And that's all the reading you were, you were never, never asked to read anything else. One plus one is two. But you never had to learn anything else. Could you balance your checkbook? Could you function? No. So there's, there's worth, there's value, there, there's reason for the flound graph Sunday school type of lessons in church. That, that, that's, but then you have to study to show yourself approved. You have to read. You've got to learn. And you say, well, yeah, I, then God, for whatever reason he knows, and he knows why, I don't. He said to me, Dave, be the pastor at Crossway Baptist. So I did. And so what do I do? I come up and I tell you this stuff. And some of it rubs off and some of you dig deeper and some of you, oh, that. But I'm here to help you with that. So you check it out. You study it up and say, no, Pastor Dave, you said, but I was reading this thing and I don't know if you were right. Keep us all together. Yes, sir. Where do we... 
at the idea that Mary was an only child and had no brothers, or even that there wasn't a legal heir who was a cousin um, who could have been you know, in that line. We don't know that Mary was an only... You're asking several questions. First, we don't know that Mary was an only child. I'm not saying she was an only child. The law of Zalapha had dealt with the fellow who had a daughter, no sons. And it could be any one of the daughters, but usually the eldest daughter would go through her first, just like it would go through the eldest son first, usually, but not necessarily. How do we know she had no brothers? The reason that is assumed, it's a good question, do we know that that's the way it was? It's assumed because Joseph comes and marries Mary, and Jesus is the one who is the king. Well, you put the, the things together, and that lines up with those laws. Okay? That's the way it lines up. Um, if you go to uh, some further study, there are other historical references to this that indicate, they don't come right out and say, here's, here, here's Heli's kids, and they, it doesn't name them all, and there's no boys. But the referencing always leads that direction. And then the legal, the legal process that went through, what else would it have been? Why would, it, why would he have gone through the law of Zalapahad to adopt Joseph if he had a son? So, when you go through the Talmudic writings and so forth and the, and, and the uh, history of the Jews, you'll find that stuff. Where do we see that they didn't utilize the law of Zalapah? Where does it reference that, that Joseph was the adopted son of Eli? To Jesus, as was supposed, the son, which is a legal term, the son of Joseph, but does it say that Joseph was, as was supposed, the legally adopted son? That's a good question. When it says, as was supposed was supposed the son of Joseph. Mm -hmm. You trace that down in the syntax of the word usage, and th those are legal terms again. Terms, right. And so when you get to all that, it's the inference of. It never says, for example, I'll give you a, an illustration from the Bible. Does the Bible ever say that there's nine planets in the universe, in our solar system, I should say, and that the earth is perfectly round, and it's, it doesn't say it, but it, it, it hints at things, and it talks about things, and you line them all up, and oh, that's what it is. Then we have found some information as time has gone on, that that's the best thing. Well, then it, uh, gotta remember, Hockham's razor. Hockham's razor. Yeah. If, if you have a question, and there's a simple explanation to it, it's probably the right one. If all indications point toward this, that's probably what it is. There's always going to be the argument, and it's up for debate. Could it have been? Well, yeah, yeah, it could have been. But I have a simple answer that meets all of the criteria. It meets all of the timelines and all the specifications. And if it's not that, then I've got, I've got all kinds of, how am I ever going to figure this out? There's, it's, right. And, and I... I see everything you're saying there as being reasonable, and a lot of it is, you know, spelled out in the scripture, so it's scriptural. But things like when, when would you say Joseph being of the legal line of Jehoiakim or the Kenaz curse, and Mary being of the bloodline of um, of David, then that union of Jesus means that they could never have a child, and either other children could have been eligible. That, that's perfectly <laughs> scriptural, legal. It makes sense. But it doesn't mean that, to my mind, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that that was it. There was nobody else in the world at the time. Except, okay, okay, I, let me, I'll answer whatever. your question. That doesn't mean, just like you go back to David, this is an important question. Just like when you go back to David, was David the only one eligible? No. No. Who did God choose? David, right. Okay, at the time of Joseph and Mary, were, might there have been anybody else eligible? There could have been. See, that's what I'm thinking. Mary's uncle. Sure. There could have been somebody else eligible. Yes. There could have possibly been somebody else eligible. Do we know that there was? We don't know, but there could there have been. Okay, so we have we have a could there have been possibility. The only thing we know for sure is after 70 AD, there couldn't have been because there would have been no legal record to show. Correct. That's when the genealogies were destroyed in the temple. So up to 70 AD, theoretically, somebody else could have said, I'm of that bloodline, I qualify. Except that the Old Testament said 
He'll come through a vir- he'll be born of a virgin, yeah, and God to, God sent the angel and said, Mary, you're the one. To be the Messiah, but not necessarily be a king. There were other kings who weren't the Messiah. But if the Messiah is the one that's coming as the ultimate king through the bloodline of David, and God chooses Mary to give birth to the promised virgin born Messiah, and his reign will be forever, that negates everybody else's possibility. Just like David was chosen by God, when David died, great uncle Fred's second son could say, well, I'm, I'm past all that. No, the house is coming through David. It's God said. So you have to get back to what did God say? So when you take all of the things that are involved, God says, this is the one. Okay? Those are good questions. And when you, whenever you discuss these things, be ready for questions because... Again, in, in uh, debate and logic, you get Hockham's razor. The simplest answer that covers the most information is probably real close to correct, if not exactly correct. So again, real briefly, if there were somebody at the same time as Heli, here I am, and I have daughters, could there have been somebody else that theoretically, legally could have, if you jump through the right legal hoops, been eligible to be king. Could have been. But the Bible says the king, the Messiah, will be born of a virgin. So nobody up to 70 AD can claim the right to be king unless they're virgin born. So you have to take everything into consideration. There's only one that was virgin born. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So it's that's where you get that where you know that they went through the law. Yes. It, it's coming up on yeah. It's coming up on the next slide or two here. Yeah. When Joseph is said to be the son of Heli, we know that the law of Salafah had had been invoked. Because that's how you go back. Yeah. Because yeah. because here it t- says his father was was Jacob. Yes, sir. The, the law of Salafah had now covered the the uh, passage of prophecy. Legal stand. Don't just think it's just property. It's legal standing, which included property. Yeah, and it usually went to the eldest son. Usually. And Mary, we're assuming, was the eldest daughter. To, to invoke the laws of Lafayette, did the husband who was going to come over like Joseph have to be the eldest son? And no. No, the, the son that was... Uh, Separating from his father didn't have to be the oldest son there. Didn't have to be. Okay. But in the genealogical records, we're saying this guy had his eldest son, his eldest son. Joseph is listed as the one. So it it is apparent then that Joseph was the eldest son in that case. Because it's listing the, the king line. Okay. Could Joseph have had other brothers? Could have, but we don't know. Okay. Again, please understand. As you go into your own study, you write the questions you have down and find the answers. The questions that have been asked me tonight, I had before, and I wrote them down, and I researched and researched and researched. One thing I'm, I'll give you, one of the things I'm bad at researching is footnotes. I try to remember, but I, I read so much and I never take, well, I got that from Josephus on page 12. I, I, I just don't do that. I write down, here's the answer. But uh, I know it can be found. And if I had the exact page number for you, I wouldn't tell you. I'd say, you go find it. Why? Because as you're digging for it, you will find questions and answers to other things that you didn't have at the time. There's no need to just come through, oh, I got the Cliff's Notes, I can pass the test. No, study it. So I'll tell you, yeah. Eusebius and, and uh, Homer. Yeah, read Homer. Yeah, him too. And Josephus. You read that. Read, your, read them all. Read them all, okay? Read the, uh, oh, I won't get into it. Okay, read everything, okay? So, uh, the law of Zalafahad, we talked about that now, how the father with no sons can have his name passed on and so forth, all right? Not only did God uh, stipulate the law in the Old Testament, 
that would cover the events leading up to the birth of his son, God inspired the New Testament writers to address a solution too. I hear you, this comes back to, to, to a point to John's question, okay, and to yours too, Dick. Not only did God put the law in the Old Testament so we saw it, you'll find this amazing as you read the Bible and study it. God anticipates everybody's question and answers it. You've heard me say before, the Bible has the answer to every legitimate question. It's not going to tell you how to fix the chain on your, on your bike. But theological, ethical, moral things, the Bible always has the answer. Okay? So he talks about it in the Old Testament, and then he anticipates somebody's going to ask a question, so he deals with it here. Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. And Jacob began, uh, begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called the Christ. Luke chapter 20, uh, 3, verse 23. Jesus himself, about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. The Greek word is nemizo. It means to do by law. It refers to Joseph as the son-in-law. Not the son, but the legal heir. The son-in-law. Grammatical, textual, technicality. It proclaims Joseph is not Jesus' dad. Okay? When we read it in English, well, people thought he was Joseph's son. That's not all it's saying. People supposed he was Joseph's son. That's how we read it in English. In the Greek, it says, Jesus, who is technically not Joseph's son. It reads out completely different. It's a legal term that means he was the adoptive son, as it were. The half-son, whatever you want to call it. So do we ever lose something in translation if we don't study it out? Yes. Does that kind of answer part of your question to a, to a oh, point? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's great. And the word, if you see the root word of nomizo, the same root is the word for Greek word for law, the Deuteronomy is the second law. Yeah. The second Deuteronomy and nomos, the law. It's actually the word for law. Nomizo is a legal term. Yeah. And it's a nickname for the law. So he was legally considered. He was legally considered Joseph's son, but he wasn't his real son. It was his stepson. Joseph was legally considered Eli's son, but in Matthew it said he was actually Jacob's son. Right. But then became Eli's son. And so going back to your original question, as you put the dots together, Occam's razor puts this as the simplest explanation with all of the terminology that's used. Okay? So now we have back to the bloodline and all that kind of stuff. Start over here with Adam, Abraham, did I say Adam, went down to David. David goes up to uh, Matthiah, or all the way down to Joseph on the blood curse. So you have to come back from Jeconiah, you've got to come back to David. Then all the way over here to Nathan, who was Solomon's brother. And you come down, and you come down, and you finally get to Heli, who was the father of Mary. Okay? So was it possible that Heli had some sons? It's possible, but it doesn't look probable because Joseph became his adoptive son and heir to the throne that he couldn't have because he was on the blood curse. Why would he have done that if Heli would have had sons? It doesn't, doesn't stand to reason. It stands to reason that he didn't. Okay? The line of promised redeemer started with the seed of the woman through Terah to Abraham, from Abraham to David through Solomon to Jeconiah. God stopped it because of the blood curse. We won't go into that account. But God had promised David's line would proceed to the Messiah, produce the Messiah. So we go back. Uh, Joseph is under the blood curse, and thus Joseph cannot be the king, nor can any of his sons. Okay? But God had promised the line to David would continue to the Messiah. So you go back to David through his son Solomon's brother Nathan. You follow it down to Heli, who was Mary's father. Heli would have been the king if Rome had not been there. Heli, as far as we know, didn't have any sons. Mary can't be king. She's a girl. So when she marries Joseph under the law of Zelophehad, Joseph's sons could be the king, but they're under the blood curse. So Mary has to have a son that's not Joseph's son, and she can't have it illegitimately, so it has to be immaculately, immaculately conceived. Okay? So as the Bible tells us, when the fullness of time was come, God sent his son. No time before that or after that would have worked. Okay? Mary was a girl. She can't be king. Numbers chapter 20, 27 says, stipulates what is to be done with the father's son. That's the law of Zelophehad in, in Numbers 27. Remember the law of Zelophehad? We went through all that. So Jesus is the last and only legal 
king. He meets all of the legal requirements. And we talked about the law of Zelophehad and so forth, but there are many other uh, stipulations that if you want to go through the study, you can. If you want, I'll you come over to my house and we'll sit down and we'll go through them. Okay? We'll study them out together. If you come over to my house, serious, I'm serious about this. If you come over and see me, the office or the house, and say, I want to do that. I'm not going to open them and say, this is everything I found. I'm going to say, let's start right here. We're all going to read together. Because you need to find it. It will mean more to you if you dig it out. I'll help you dig it out. But if you find it yourself, you'll say, oh, yeah. It's a whole lot better than me just handing you the notes. That's why the Bible says you study to show yourself approved. Don't take the notes that Dave Anneman gave you. Use those as a guide, perhaps, as a, as, a, as a path to follow, if you will. Like the Apostle Paul said, I don't put myself on par with the Apostle Paul at all, but it's like this. Paul says, as I follow Christ, follow me. If I'm in the Bible, follow me. If you, like, John's question, well, the Bible doesn't say that specifically. No, it doesn't. That's a legitimate and honest question. The Bible does not specifically say that. Let's go back and see what the Bible exactly says. What else can it be? Pretty much nothing. Well, but if and if and that, it might have, I got seven ifs and a couple of that's and how abouts, but I've got one that answers it all and meets all the law's requirements. That's probably it. Okay? If you can come up with a better one, I, hey, I might be wrong. Come up with a better one. Show me where I missed something. I'm not saying I have it. I'm saying if you can find where I missed something, I want to know it. Okay? Luke chapter 2, verse 4. And Joseph also went up out of Galilee into the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and the lineage. The house is referring to the law through David and the lineage by blood through Nathan. Those are two specific legal things he had to be. He cannot be the lineage through Solomon. He's of the house, David, and the lineage, Nathan, therefore skipping past and not being affected by the law of the, the curse on Jeconiah. Okay? Okay. Another specification that's really important. We've talked about this a little bit. She was virgin born, immaculately conceived. Mary was a virgin. The Hebrew of the word virgin is Alma. It is a general term. It means a lass, a young girl, a veiled one, a damsel, a maid, a virgin. Virgin is implied but not required to understand the Hebrew word. Okay? The meaning of the Hebrew word is indistinct outside the context of the statement. A sign, a virgin will conceive. Well, if she's just a young girl, how is that a sign? It has to be something different than she's just a young girl. The Hebrew word virgin can mean virgin. It can mean several other things. Well, we think it means something else. Well, it's a sign that the virgin will conceive. So in the Hebrew, you just get a hint at it. However, uh, Philadelphus uh, Ptolemaeus in Egypt, who took over the Egyptian part of Alexander the Great's kingdom, uh, had a bunch of uh, written work gathered together and translated from their original languages into Greek. And one of those was the Old Testament scriptures. And he had Greek fellows who knew, knew Hebrew, and he got some uh, Hebrew scholars, Bible scholars, who knew Greek and said, when we translate this, let's make sure we have the right word. And in Greek, there is a word that means young girl, damsel, all those things. Greek also has a word that means virgin, the way we understand virgin. And the Hebrew scholar said, use that one. She's a virgin. When Jesus and the apostles and in the New Testament gospels, they write about the virgin, they use the Greek word. They refer to the Greek texts of the, the Septuagint, not the Hebrew. They want to make sure everybody's clear on this. God anticipates everybody's questions. So when he quotes the Old Testament, he quotes the Greek. You understand? All right. So, simply a young girl giving birth, it would not be some miraculous sign. The Greek translation of the Old Testament, known as Septuagint, we talked about that, 300 years prior to the birth of Christ. Jewish leaders and Jesus and the inspired New Testament writers all validated the lexicon by quoting from both it and the Hebrew text interchangeably. Jesus and the apostles and the, even the Old Testament fellas, the, the Jewish fellas, 
when they're quoted in the Bible, sometimes they're quoting the Hebrew Old Testament, wasn't the Old Testament, please, the Old Testament scriptures, and they also quote the Septuagint interchangeably. Both of them are correct. Okay? Because both the secular religious leaders and Jesus and the apostles all quote interchangeably from the Hebrew text and the Greek text, both are given legitimacy. But if there's a question about the poetic language of the Hebrew and you want to really want to get to what it really, really means, what can you do? Look at the Greek. But it wasn't written in Greek. It was translated. Yes, but Jesus quotes the Greek translation. That at the time of Jesus' earthly ministry, the Greek translation was 300 years old. Okay? So when somebody comes to you and says, well, you know, yeah, the Bibles are this and the Bibles are that and it's the copies of copies of copies. Wait a second. Jesus quoted from a 300-year-old copy. So does age mean that the copy is illegitimate? All right, so let's come to today. When you go to a Bible today, can you go back even today and get the Greek and the Hebrew originals? You can't find the actual, because it's rotted away by now, but can you get a copy that is accurate? Yes, you can. When they found the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, they found almost, almost the entire book of Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And as they've analyzed it, it's exactly like the one they've got that they wrote last week. Not one thing different. Other parts of the Bible they have pieces of and that kind of stuff, and they're all exactly like. But the book of Isaiah, they have almost the entire book of Isaiah found in these ancient, ancient manuscripts, and they're exactly correct. Has God preserved his word? Can it be checked out? Can it be verified? Can it be relied upon and trusted then? Yes, it can. Enough of that for right now. The Greek the word virgin is parthenos. It's a specific term. It can only mean virgin, non-sexually involved. That's all it can mean. It can't mean anything else. The virgin birth is hinted at in Eden with Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It's prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 7, 14. It's required by the blood curse of Jeremiah 22, 30. So according to Occam's razor, the simplest answer that gets all of the questions right is probably the right one. God says, your seed will come. Has to be a virgin birth. Blood curse on Jeconiah. Law of Zalapahad. Okay. So, nothing is by accident. This ends tonight's lesson. Just to give you an idea. This has nothing to do with Christmas or the virgin birth or anything like that. This is just for to study, to understand. We have the names Adam, Seth, Enos, uh, Kenan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. In the Bible, th these are the names of the people from Adam to Noah. Those are their names. Now, look at me. Don't look at the wall. As Americans... Speaking English, what's the most important thing to us about the names? How do you pronounce them? Oh, I know, that guy, his name is Enoch. It's not Enoch, or it's Enoch. I know what his name is. However, Hebrew is a gametria language. Every syllable has a numeric value, and every syllable has a meaning. That's important. So in the culture of learning... You don't read Adam, you read Adam. In Hebrew, you read man. Seth is how you say the word, but the word means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahaliel means the blessed one. Jared means shall come down. So what is, what is Jared's really, what's his name? Coming down. Now how many of you would name your son coming down? You wouldn't. That's not what we do in America. But what's the name that means coming down? Jared. I have a nephew, Jared. What does his name actually mean? Now, in a, here, how many of you have ever bought a book? You're going to have kids, so you buy the book, Names and Their Meanings. So you want to make, oh man, let's give them a really good name that means uh, the royal king of Tallahassee. We, we all do that, right? Well, we only do that as a novelty. But you take Adam to Noah and read what their names mean. Man is appointed to be mortal. He has sorrow, but the blessed one shall come down, teaching that by his death the despairing will have comfort and rest. 
Does God have people born and named on purpose or on accident? In Genesis chapter 6, God says, I created man, things are going to happen, and I'm going to send my son to bring them comfort and rest. The Holy One is going to come down and do it. Is the gospel taught in the Old Testament? Back in Genesis chapter 6, if you study, you can learn, you can know, you can rightly divide the word of truth. And this is this little name thing, that's, that's just peanuts. I encourage you, study your Bible. So tonight we talked about just some of the legalities of the birth of Jesus. There are many more and a lot more detail in the ones that we brought out tonight. I'm working on a message, and so far I've got over 700 fulfilled prophecies. It's more than one night. <laughs> okay. So when I get done with it, it might be six months or two years from now before I finish it all. I'm trying to get it to where I can present it. But in the life of Christ, here are hundreds of the Bible said this would happen, and this is the way it is, and it was detailed. Okay? Not like when you watch, I remember years ago watching Johnny Carson, and uh, I forget the lady's name now. She was big New York Times uh, prognosticator. What's your, Johnny would say, well, what's your big Gene, prediction? What? Was it Gene, uh, Gene Dixon. Gene Dixon, yeah. And he said, what's your big prediction for 1967? Oh, somebody with dark hair will win some money. Really, that's it? G give me something. Yes, uh, somebody out there will be very fortunate. Okay. God says, no, this place, this time, he's going to be the son of this guy. Uh, detail, 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 detail. And oh, by the way, he'll be left-handed with a goofy ear, and he'll ride a three-legged mule. Uh, really? That deal? I'm making that up, okay. But it's that kind of details. Exceedingly detailed. And oh, by the way, there's 17 legal requirements for that to happen. Not only did it happen, but it happened, and it met all the law. And you go back and read the law, and the laws are just, really? Why do you have that law? Because I can fulfill that, God says. Okay? Can you read, know, understand, and trust the Bible to be what it is? Yeah, it's the Word of God. Any questions? Any more comments? Anyone at all? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord God, we thank you for your love for us. Help us to serve and honor Jesus Christ in all that we think, do, and say. Help us, Lord, to know what the Bible says, live according to it, and tell others about it. For it's in the name of Christ I pray, for his will I ask. Amen. Now we have an offering to take.